Welcome to Municipal Affairs. I'm your host, Christopher Brown. This is the first installment of our three-part series dedicated to unraveling the dynamic and pivotal role of the Chief Administrative Officer in the intricate landscape of municipalities. Now, in today's episode, we will be delving deep into the heart of municipal governments, examining the responsibilities, challenges, and the evolving significance of that CAO. Joining us in this insightful discussion are two esteemed guests. Ken Glover, president of Human Edge, a renowned Canada-wide executive search firm specializing in executive leadership placements, and Christopher Parker, a seasoned professional with years of experience as a CEO in various municipalities, coupled with an impressive 11-year tenure as a Nova Scotia municipal councillor. Now, our conversation today aims to shed light on the multifaceted aspects of the CAO's role, exploring the intricacies of the collaboration with municipalities and the critical impact they have on local governance. We will explore the delicate balance between the CEO's strategic vision and the need for harmonious collaboration within the municipal leadership team. Furthermore, our discussion will unravel the intriguing questions of whether the role of the CAO remains as desirable today as it was in the past. Now, with Christopher and Ken's firsthand experience spanning over a decade, we'll analyze how the landscape has evolved and whether the evolving demands of municipal governments impact the attractiveness of the CAO's position. Throughout this episode, we'll navigate the complexities of finding a good CAO and delve into the strategies and qualities that contribute to a CAO's success in fostering positive relationships with elected officials and the broader municipal administration. So as we embark on this exploration of the CAO's world, we invite you to gain a deeper understanding of the crucial role these professionals play in shaping the trajectory of municipalities. So stay tuned for insightful anecdotes and expert perspectives on what makes a CEO and an indispensable architect of effective local governance. This is Municipal Affairs. Uh, Chris and Ken, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Before we get into the interview and the crux of the interview about what makes a good CAO and what council should be looking for in a good CAO, I want to sort of get the listeners and the viewers to understand who you are and how you sort of relate to this topic. So we'll start with Ken first. Ken, can you just give a brief introduction of who you are and what brings you here? For sure, Chris. Thank you very much. And and let me compliment you hats off to this podcast. Uh, well, well deserved for this uh, community and this industry. It's a long time and I just love it. It's helpful. It's informative and uh, keep it keep it going. So I'm the president of Human Edge. Human Edge is an executive and senior level search firm. We provide those services and HR consulting services to municipalities across Canada. So that's that's our role, and we're quite involved in municipal space at at many levels. Thanks, Ken and Chris pa Christopher Parker. Yourself? Well, yeah, really quickly. Um, I was a counselor for eleven years, and then uh, I realized, uh, you know, I want to do something different, and I ended up uh, becoming a CAO, and I've been a CAO for twelve years, and enjoy every minute of it. So for those who are listening, you kind of assume uh, what this is going to be about is about the search for a good CAO and the qualities one should be looking for in themselves if they were potentially going into that field. I want to start with you, Ken, if you don't mind, because your organization, Human Edge, your business, Human Edge, you look for a potential CAO that council is looking for. Um I'm assuming each community is different. Every community has their own unique challenges and opportunities that lie ahead. But what is the overarch theme that councils look for in a good CAO? Well, let's start out by saying what a council wants and needs can be very different. And, uh, and, and, and we come across all of that spectrum. Uh, we do respond to the needs of council. It's imperative that we meet with council before we conduct a CAO search to get a flavor for and assess the needs. So we're in a position to articulate the culture, perhaps, of the community and definitely the nature and engagement level of council and any particular needs they have. But in general, 
you know, in general, council's always looking for a CAO, and, and I pan over to the latest search we did for a CAO. They, they want someone with leadership skills, obviously. The staff relationship is imperative. Um, community engagement is imperative. Relationship with council, or the ability to strike and establish relationship with council, all councils. Uh, is imperative. Organizational management, uh, legislative understanding, community, I mentioned that. Budget finance, again, not necessarily have to be a CPA, but have some grasp of that process. Economic development has become an increasing requirement uh, among CAO uh, talent, or at least the ability to direct and manage that. Um, simply because of economy time, economic times. But to, to, to capsule your question, really it varies. Every council does look for something a little different at the time. Uh, I have had engagements with councils where they said, Ken, um, we want somebody to really dissect this organization, analyze it, and we're not afraid of turning it upside down if necessary. And others want, um, you know, stability, continuity, and fair, uh, obviously, uh, 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 successful uh, uh, moving the, I guess, the needle forward for the community. So on the flip side of that, Christopher, I, I want to ask because you've been in the role and again, kind of alluded to the needs and wants of a council, but what does a prospective CAO look for in a council or in a community? Because you have to be sure that you go into a community that is going to be the right fit for you. And you have been in that chair. What would a prospective CAO look for in a council or even in a municipality to make sure they are a good fit? Well, the, the, first of all, I think one of the most important components of it is, is, is you have to look at the organization and does its values and uh, um, meet your values. Because what happens here is um, I do a lot of research. Usually when I go to a community, I watch their videos. If they're on videos, I watch how they interact with each other. I, I watch how they interact with uh, the public. I watch how they interact with staff. Um, and if you look at some of those, you can get a lot of information about a, a, a council just by watching. Um, you can start reviewing. I, I have a tendency to look at a lot of the agendas. What are the type of items that are going to the agendas? Because if they're getting into the minutia, the, the, the very fine weeds, is that the type of person that you are? Uh, if you don't care about it, then that's fine. But there's other CAOs who are like, no, those are the weeds. Stay out of it. Um, so doing a lot of homework, making sure that your values are the same values that they're looking for and their actions and persona is very similar to yours because otherwise you can have a short lived uh, a, a term at a location. And if I may add, um, I always remind any, every client, uh, municipalities included, is, is the candidates are assessing them just as much as they are being assessed by council. And you're right, Chris, I get questions from candidates uh, asking me, well, what is governance like? I mean, Chris, you've had Mr. Ian McCormick on before Strategic Steps, who, who's driving the greater at that municipality? And, and that is a key question of any CAO candidate worth their salt is they, they don't, they're not afraid of turmoil and conflict or, or dis, disagreement. It's, it's, it's the ability to move things forward and address it. And um, yeah, they're assessing council just as much as council's assessing them. How important, yeah. and this is a question for both of you, if you don't mind, if I jump in here for a second, how important is that? Because traditionally, and I say traditionally in the sense that uh, there, more often than not, it is not uh, someone internally, sometimes it is, but sometimes it is an external factor, and they are coming into an organization where council has set their ways. And they have they are sort of set in the, and even administration is set in the ways of how things are done. When someone like a CAO who is the top job, it is the only employee of council comes in. Is there a sort of a grace period where council has to look at what's going on internally and say, okay, we're giving sort of carte blanche to the new incoming CAO to do with what they want? 
or does the CAO have to sort of give carte blanche to what's already gone on and say, I'm not going in to cause waves the first few months. I want to see how everything progresses. What should council be looking for in that particular relationship? And what should the CAO be looking for in that particular race relationship? Who wants to take that first? Go ahead, Chris. Christopher. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I think what you're talking about is just relationship building. And, uh, you know, how can you develop a, a good relationship? I think both But is it CAO... though? But I apologize. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to challenge you a little bit on here for Chris, okay. because this but... is a very important job for the municipality. It is the one job that the municipality, the council has the right to fire and hire. That is it. No yeah. one else. Okay. And if they get it wrong, it looks bad on them. Relationship building is one thing, but getting the right person is a completely different entity. Well, in our exercise, if I may, yeah, sure. you know, there's councils that go uh, utilize internal process to hire. But when we function as an external support in this process, we make sure we do whatever we can for success. And that is uh, the interview process. So you get two or three finalists uh, in that process. It, it should be a, an in-person interview uh, by that stage. There should be no skeletons in closets. There should be all the issues on the table and the, the the discerning questions raised and discussed. So they really get an understanding for the expectations of counsel and, and of the candidate. Um, upon that hiring stage and shortly thereafter, onboarding is extremely important. I think there's a statistic that 30% of the people leave within the first Two, two weeks and or one month of uh, of being hired, we always advise a round table with council. Um, ideally, if you have the former CAO, if there wasn't any issues, you 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 have them facilitate that and there's a there's an overlaying period. But you ultimately, as Christopher said, the communications and and shake the trees, you you really have to have that conversations. So let me answer it in a different way. It's it's, it's basically how do you ensure that you know uh, um, councils get the right CAO and get that right candidate? Is the, if that's what you're looking at, well, I, I look at it three different things. Number one, I'm a firm believer hire out an outside consultant. Period. I don't like internal um, ones, and, and 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 I'll tell you why. The first reason is if you work with a lot of professional companies, such as like Ken's or or there's lots of them out there, they're always on the phone, picking up the phone. They're talking to potential candidates, even if they're not looking and they're saying what's happening. They get an idea of what that candidate is like. And when they talk to the client and the client says, this is the type of person we have, Ken has a list of people that would be good at this job. And I know he's going to pick up the phone and he's going to say, hey, are you interested in coming over? Uh, it happens like that. That's one of the things. So he tries to match the candidate with the client if they're they're very honest. The other problem is, is when you do it yourself, sometimes it's not done professionally. And, it, and I'll give you a perfect example. There was a, one of the towns um, is no longer a town. So you could start to guess which one it was. They actually um, did a CAO search on themselves uh, for by themselves. And when they went in on the agenda, they listed in camera going into CAO search. Then they listed the three candidates' names. Well, if I'm a candidate, I don't want my name on a, an agenda because my current employer, who you might not know that I'm looking, is going to be a little upset. And and, and so um, those are the things that happens. Where I've heard, and, and I've seen it happen, actually, uh, where counselors will pick up the phone and they will phone the current counselors and say, what's this guy like? or girl like you know and and that's the problem it's uh yeah you know, i always hire out doesn't matter and i always recommend to hire out the second big thing is is you have to be that open and honest what do you really want you can't say you want this then you get a candidate who does this and you say whoa 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 i didn't expect him to do this um and a perfect example is uh <laughs> I'm going to flip to a, a, a provincial election where uh, one of the premiers said, this is what I'm going to do, this, this, this. He got elected, and then he started doing this, this, this. And people say, why are you doing this? He said, I told you I was going to do this. Simple as that. That was Ralph Klein. 
<laughs> and what happened was is he got chewed out for doing what he actually said he was going to do. So you got to be on the same uh, 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 wavelength there. And, and you know, I think having that open communication with the consultant and the candidate will help you. Is it hard to have that communication in such a short period of time? Because I've seen a CEO job hunts take six months. I've seen CEO jobs take five years. I've seen CEO jobs take three weeks. And in that short period of time, you have to gain a respect for somebody, learn about them, try to figure out what you need as counsel and you need as administration and what the CEO needs and try to find that perfect fit. Is it reasonable that mistakes are going to be made along the way once a prospective candidate does get selected? And like Christopher just said, oh, I didn't expect you to do this. Well, I told you I was going to do it. So for you, Ken, when you're talking to councils, how much leeway do you tell them that you have to give this prospective candidate or whoever the successful candidate is in doing their job that you have identified as laid out in the job requirement that you're looking for in the CAO. Yeah, I mean, councils have to give some time for an individual to adjust and adapt. Uh, depending on the scenario, they could be dealing with animosities. Depending on the scenario, they could be dealing with people that don't want to change. And that is incredibly difficult. You know, you if you want a professional that has is empathetic but still um, wanting to improve the community and respond to the strategic direction of council, um, they also have to uh, be cautious. The organization doesn't implode. So there's there's a lot of people management. This is where I, I hope councils give that latitude and respect. But then the CAO needs to apprise council of what's going on and what the climate is like, because oftentimes councils don't know. Um, even even if some councillors are very connected to some of the individuals, um, they may not have the full picture. So there's no real formula, exact formula. We, we have been very successful in, in finding people that have fit, um, but there are individuals on council at times that do a 180 um, based on what they've asked for or based on um, what they've um, committed to with the rest of council and um, decided to go back um, perhaps uh, how they functioned in the prior or what caused the previous CAO to depart. Uh, not sure, uh, but we we do come across those situations. And I've had CAO candidates I've placed to ask me, uh, Ken, uh, it's been six months here and, and I'm seeing a different council than what I interviewed with. Um, and, and unfortunately, those things happen. And maybe they happen also on the flip side. For you, Christopher, um, when a when you go into a new community like you have as CAO, you have to balance what council has directed you to do and with the realities of what administration can do. How important is it to not only just build that relationship with council, but build also as quick of a relationship with the administration. And I'm not just saying senior staff, and don't get me wrong, a city and a village are going to be two different things. You're going to be able to know everyone in a village or a town. You're not going to know all your administration in a city. But how important is it to build on the opposite end for a CAO on a quick uh, pace as well compared to the uh, relationship you're building with council? Well, just speaking from going into a couple of different uh, organizations, there's always that um, concern from administration that, oh, my God, you're going to come in here and you're going to do major changes. Um, I've always asked this question. I've always asked, OK, tell me one good thing about the organization, what we're doing. And if you could change one thing, what's that one thing you could do to change? And what that happens is then. You're getting them involved in if you are going to do changes and there's themes that happen almost all the time. Um, they're feeling part of that change then and they're feeling they're in control of it as opposed to it being top heavy down. And, it, and I'll give you an example. This is one of the toughest ones that I went into. I went into this one organization. I asked that question. And, and, and I start off with the, the senior management and then I go to the managers and then I even ask uh, frontline staff and I was in, in this one individual's office and I said, okay, what's one thing you could change, right? And the individual responded and said, it doesn't matter. 
And I said, what do you mean it doesn't matter? Ah, you're not going to be here in three months. So, and I looked at that and I thought, holy mackerel, I'm your boss. Was that ever insolent? What happened to you that you would say that to me right now? And I, I, I could not understand why they were so demoralized. Turned out to be the best worker. But what was happening is this individual consistently had people that would, um, she'd make decisions, then they would report to council, then council would come on in, or the CAO would come on in and overturn her decision, even though her decision was right. And it was so, um, I made sure that never happened. Um, I always said, explain to me why you made that decision. And then I always defended uh, the particular individual. So um, that's building a staff to make sure that, you know, you're new, you're going to be supportive of them. Um, but also, they got to be supportive of council too. So they, can, they, I, and, can I ask you a very poignant question right now, Christopher? Go ahead. As the role of the CAO, which relationship is more important to a CAO, the administration or council? Both. And I'm going to tell you why. You need your people to get all your objectives done and everything done. You can't do it by yourself. And you need to have the, the trust of council so that you can do these things. And they'll give you the resources so you can do these things. It's not a one or the other. Um, and I'll give you an example. Like, like here. Staff should never trash council. And council should never trash. Sorry, I, I shouldn't laugh. I apologize for that. Yeah, well, they they shouldn't. And 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 I'm going to tell you, you can have difficult council members. You have to understand why they are the way they are. And if you understand why they are the way they are, you can change your whole thinking on it. So you don't trash council, but you don't allow council to trash staff. And I've seen it in council meetings where. You know, you, you'll have a, a staff report and the CIO will sit and do nothing once and, 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 and they'll watch their their staff member get just raked over the coals. Um, I had a situation in one of my places. I stopped the meeting. I leaned over to the, the chair and I took counsel's side. And I said, you can't do that. If you want to attack, you attack me. You attack me in in camera. You will not do that. You know, and, and, and that's the problem. So you got to do those two things. And then the last thing I think when you're trying to develop it, sometimes when people, you know, especially staff members, when they're giving recommendations to council, they become personal. And sometimes council will not accept those recommendations. They'll go a different direction. You say, go right. They say, let's go left. And then they get upset about it. Don't make it personal. They are making a decision based on lots of items, not just your um, uh, recommendation. There's some political reasons why they're doing it. There's some financial reasons there. There's... I hate to say it, electability issues that they're looking at, you know? So there's a lot of different reasons why they'll they'll go one way or the other. Um, so don't make it personal. Don't get too excited. It is, uh, as long as they say, when you go left, it's not breaking the law, hey, go left. What's the big deal? That is imperative. Uh, all those things you mentioned, Christopher, that's why in our process, we always interview, include interviews with directors, direct reports to the CAO or who will be, direct reports is just to understand you know, what what was that culture like uh, with the prior and what are you hoping for moving forward? And sometimes you can uh, and will learn things that council is unaware of. So it's very helpful. It's very helpful. And you do need a team. It takes a team to move that organization forward. So we are recording this in 2024, and I want to talk about the role of the CAO, because in case someone's listening to this in 2025 or 2026, who knows, but in 2024, I want to look back because the role of the municipality has changed dramatically over the last 5, 10, even 20 years, I would say. For you, Ken, are you seeing mm -hmm. councils looking for different qualities in a CAO than five years ago, 10 years ago, even 20 years ago. And for you, Christopher, how have you seen the role of CAO change when it comes to the expanding roles that the municipality is playing right now? And how do CAO sort of keep up with the sort of downloading, as we always call it, from provincial or federal government? So from you, Ken, are you seeing councils want sort of a jack of all trades, but a master of none? Or are you looking, are they looking for someone who has a key area or a key discipline that their quality that they have? 
Well, I, first of all, I, I want to make mention of that University of Calgary study with the School of Public Policy on, um, you know, the trends and changes back in two thousand or September twenty three. Uh, they they published this uh, the document on a study called "Lonely at the Top" and they, <laughs> referring to Chief Administrative Officers. Great, great document. Uh, very statistical, but but some good learnings on trends. And yes, I believe and have seen an increased requirement of skills among CAOs to fully achieve their roles. Um, people management, people skills have always been and will always be the priority. You cannot be in that role without some people skills, soft skills, and and and, and very um, program project management uh, skills as well. But moving forward with the advent of social media, um, Christopher alluded to all council sessions now being on camera and televised. There are some skills for diplomacy. There are some skills, public speaking, um, accounting, finance, a knowledge of the various legislation you reside in, in the provinces. You have to be extremely astute. Political acumen is now something that councils ask for because uh, securing time or face time or or meeting time with ministers is becoming imperative for survival in some communities. Having that ability to partner, to collaborate, um, it is a, a very daunting uh, role. Um, this is why we're seeing trends in in pressure and stress. Uh, this is why we're seeing trends in compensation changes, ask and demand. So I'm sure we'll talk about that. But I would say it has definitely increased um, in terms of the requirement of the individual now to fulfill a CAO role. Before I throw it over to Christopher here and ask you that question again, I want to stick on this question here for a second, Ken. And I've got to ask, since COVID-19, and I hate bringing it up because it seems like we're on the other end of it and things are getting back to quote unquote normal. Are you seeing council Councils wanting someone who is also an expert in potentially health, the health field, that if something like this was to happen again, they would, a uh, CAO would be prepared for any potential global pandemic. Well, in most provinces, one of the requirements or preferences of a CAO is to have their DEM, um, which is uh, uh, the emergency management uh, certification. So um, I think it was a learning experience. Uh, definitely understanding the impact on the organization, on the people, on the individuals. Uh, being a leader versus not a leader really shone. I think that has actually stimulated some of the removals of CAOs because they just found they weren't leaders in those situations. And it was time to find someone who can. But definitely it's had an impact on all of us. We see it in people's choices for their careers, their decisions we're putting up with, whatever they're putting up with in the community they're at. I I can't do this much longer. I, I want a more stable, calm council. So I'm applying elsewhere. So we're seeing a whole gamut of things. The reason I brought that up is for a later, a little bit of a later conversation, but thank you so much for putting that out there. Um, Christopher, I do want to uh, follow up with you. You have been a CAO. You have been a CEO for relatively the last 15 years, if I'm not mistaken, looking through your past resident, but 12 years. Has the role of the CAO changed or is it pretty much the same? Just different communities have different responsibilities and the CEO has to adapt to what the community needs are instead of what the job needs are. Well, I, I think it's changed. I, I want to talk a little bit about when I was a counselor and then I went to uh, being a CAO. In, in 2000, when I was a counselor, um, Facebook was just starting. It was, it, it was, it was a non-entity. And what I have noticed over the last 20 years is basically politics has become more polarizing. You're either with us or you're against us. And it becomes very, very aggressive. Um, and transparency, <laughs> need for transparency. Right. And, 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 and exactly. And, 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 and the issue is, is, is I think um, when I was on council, I was on the third largest council in, in, in Nova Scotia. We never had a strategic plan until 2011, just the year I was leaving. It was, um, yeah, I know no strategic plan. 
I think it's important to make sure that you have strategic plans, policies, and budgets, and they all interrelate. That's a big thing that you need to do here. But you also have to adapt your communications because the issue that you're running into right now is people are, if you don't tell a story soon enough, they're going to tell a different one and you're going right. to be in trouble. So that's one of the problems. And what I see in the future is going to be an issue and people should be aware of it is the deep fake videos with, uh, you know, AI. Um, it's so easy now to make deep fake videos. I could see someone making them a, a staff member saying, oh, this is what's happening just to stir up the politics or of current council members or people running for council. And most people, when you say this, it's like, oh yeah, really, it, it's going to happen. Trust me. Okay. That, that's a bomb that you've just thrown into the conversation yeah. that we might have to come around to in a few seconds. But I want to talk about the person for a second, because in 2024, I have noticed on LinkedIn, because that's where I get most of my social media now, because it's nice and friendly and everyone enjoys their life on uh, LinkedIn. Um, there seems to be a lot of turnover at the top job, especially in the new year being 2024. What draws someone into becoming a CAO? What is the thing that someone says to themselves, you know what, I want to go Take leave my public sector job, the private sector job, and go into the public sector as the role of the CAO. I'm going to start with Christopher on this one. Then I'm going to throw it over to Ken because you have heard from CAOs. So what made you change, Christopher, from being a counselor to being the person in the office, talking to administration and setting those meetings with provincial cabinet ministers? I can get things done. As a counselor... No, I'm sorry, I hate to be rude about it, but with council, you're working on the strategic plan, you're working on uh, the policies, you're working on the high level stuff, the 30,000 foot stuff, and you want to fill the potholes. And as a CAO, I can get so many things done. And and, and I'll tell you exactly what happened, what made me do this change. Uh, we were part of um, uh, FCM's uh, Municipal Partnership Program, and we actually had a project in Cambodia. And the staff member who was supposed to be doing it left our organization and no other staff member wanted to do it. So they they looked and they said, hey, let's send it to Parker. Maybe he'll go there and not come back. So I, I ended up uh, going to Cambodia, working on the municipal partnership program. And I had to go back six months later and we saw the change. And I realized, man, I wanna do something. I wanna get my hands dirty. And that's what got me into this field. You, If you are the type of individual who really wants to affect change in a community, the CAO role is the, the one for you. Now, that doesn't mean you shouldn't understand the pitfalls of it because you do serve at the pleasure of counsel. Today, you're the best person. Tomorrow, you're the devil sometimes. So just be aware of it. that happens. It could change that fast. But if you're aware of that and you're the type of a, a, a personality like and, and I am, I've got this red personality is red, blue, green. Red is action oriented. Uh, and blue is you care for people and green is pers uh, basically policy want. I love to get things done. And um, I find it exciting. I are encourage you, people to get. Are you seeing, Christopher, are you seeing more people because for those who are, and I apologize to say this this way, but I got it kind of have to. We are seeing more and more people of your age. You are of a generation that seems to want to take on these leadership roles. I'm seeing the Gen X, the Gen Ys, the millennials not wanting to do the jobs that you, the CAO. Are you seeing that in your line of work? And then I'm going to jump over to Ken on that question and talk about sort of what you're hearing from prospective candidates. Well, I do a lot of mentoring. So I've, I've mentored a lot of uh, SAOs up in uh, the Northwest Territories. And I also mentor a lot of um, uh, CAOs. So uh, friends that I know, uh, individuals that I know, people I don't even know. And I'll give you an example. Like sometimes when a, a CAO is terminated, I will pick up the phone call, uh, phone, and I will phone them. And I will help them through that process. Because it is a very devastating type process. Uh, uh, for them to to go through. And they, they need some people just to help them out. And um, so do I see younger people? I, I encourage younger people, but be aware of the pitfalls. That's all I say. Um, I'm very lucky. I have a wonderful wife. She's a nurse. 
her skills are transferable in every community. And when I go into interviews and I say they're, she's a nurse, they almost want to hire me, not because of me, but because of her. <laughs> so, um, and, and, and she doesn't mind the moving around a little bit. But um, there's other individuals I could see if they're a little bit younger and they have young kids, they might say, I'm going to wait until, you know, my kids are, you know, 18, 19, 20, you know, out of the house and uh, which is fine too, you know. Um, and then I see some younger people get involved in it. Um, it flips. Um, it's a great field though. So for you, Ken, you, you get hired by council and I, I say you as in human edge gets hired by council yep. to do an executive search. Um, Correct. You, you go out and you look for prospective candidates. How do you draw someone in to say, you know what, come work in a, a position where it's at the whim of six people, seven people, eight people, or however many people around the council and make a difference in your community. And what do you hear from prospective candidates when they either say, I'd be interested or heck no, I'm not going in there with a 10 foot pole because I saw what's going on in their community. Yeah. But to preface, let, let's, you know, I, I hearken back to that study. The average tenure now of a CAO is just under the term of a counselor, which is approximately four years. So that's a definitely something potential candidates are looking at. Um, we'd love the world to have, uh, uh, you know, more CAOs, maybe like uh, uh, Shelly Armstrong in Flagstaff County, who's been there 38 plus years. But, you know, they've got some recipe that works. Um, we, when we go to market uh, for a council, uh, for a community, we're actually seeing a trend in, in increased um interest among the young when i say younger i'm talking about perhaps somebody who's been in a managerial role within a municipality for a while they've accomplished some public uh, administration uh, formalized courses and and they want to move their career in this direction perhaps they've been a director of something within the organization and and they would like to take that next step there is that element out there we do have a, a very uh, limited workforce to fill some of these vacancies, especially in northern communities and rural. Unfortunately, they are suffering. I think we're seeing a council that's being a little more flexible on that flexible work week and um, perhaps accommodating the family uh, individual um, with some home work days, if, if possible. Obviously, a CAO has to be present and has to be uh, available. But uh, there is, we're noticing more flexibility. On the interest side, we are seeing interest from private sector individuals as well as public. And it's interesting to see some councils who once used to say, no, you have to be from the municipal sector, that's it, are endorsing and accepting some people from the private sector with the proper management skills and capacity and maybe some more than likely some exposure to the municipal sector. But... I, you, I would can say I, can that. Can I jump in there for a second? Yeah. Because I, I want to use Chris's, Christopher's analogy here for a second. Are you seeing more counselors becoming CAOs? I, I take in I take into uh, yeah. I, I look at Selkirk, Manitoba, where Dwayne Nickel was a former counselor, yeah. and then he resigned and became CAO of the community, and he's been there for some time now. He enjoys it. Him and the mayor get along quite well. But are you seeing CAOs sort of being filled by those counselors who? in the words of Christopher, want to get something well, done? Well, we've had, we've had counselors in our candidate pools. Um, my experience has, it doesn't always work out. That is, they don't rise to the top in comparison to some of the other candidates we've had. Very rarely have we seen a counselor be hired by counsel uh, as their CAO. Um, there, there's a dynamic there. There's definitely a, a respect for the knowledge and the perspective. Uh, that is definitely complementary, but uh, um, it, it, it's very rare. They, they have to have many other skill sets that are that are uh, accompanying that pursuit. But I just want to go back to your question, why are people applying? And I do ask that. That's our first question in every candidate who applies. Why are you applying? And it's this Sat not satisfaction, this desire to help, this desire and compassion for improving their communities. It's uh, some of it is a reflection of how important communities are. Because when we were all going through COVID, it was the communities, the municipalities 
that kept the sewers running, that kept the water running, that still provided uh, enforcement and garbage services. I, I mean, that really reflected on a lot of people in this industry and, and in this profession. Um, but I, I, I'm, I'm optimistic and I, we do see some a great young crop out there. Um, but it is challenging because there's a very limited appetite to move far north or far rural. And that is going to be a challenge and continue to be. Because, I, because I'm cautious of time and I want to get to burnout because I think this is the other facet that a lot of people may not understand. And Ken, you've mentioned it a few times, so I'm going to throw it to you on this one. The average lifespan of a CAO in a municipal, municipal government is approximately four years, which is a length of a council term. They usually get elected the year after an election and they are, hey, go look for another job a year after the next election. That being said, people can burn out in these jobs. How important is it for a council to find someone who they can rely on and not be the sort of everything needs to get done that council wants, but also push back a little bit and say, we would love to do that, but this is the, this is what we can do as administration. And this is what you want to do as administration. And we're going to push back on you. So that way administration doesn't burn out. So they, they quit and leave. And I as CAO don't burn out and quit and leave by what you want done in our community. Well, we're in an era of heightened awareness for men mental health, and that is fabulous. Um, there are tools, there are services, uh, and and you you just hope people take advantage of that. But it is the nature of all CAOs I've interviewed and met to want to really make a difference and solve solve problems and make better, and that's an ominous task. And and if you're an individual that that puts things on your shoulder. And as Chris man Christopher mentioned, taking it personally, it can eat away at you. And and it never ends. It does not end. Um, as council, mayors, Reeves, uh, it's incumbent upon you to observe your CAO, in my opinion, and ask if they need assistance. Um, recognize uh, the pressures because they are getting it from their great payers and they are forwarding it to the CEO or they need a solution addressed prompt to right away. Um, there needs to be some buffer zone. There needs to be some measurements of maybe patience, maybe timelines, and maybe check-ins. So definitely in this era of instantaneous expectations, a CEO is under a lot of pressure, no matter the size of the organization, city manager, what have you. Um, so I'm hoping uh, both parties, both sides recognize that it can happen to them. Yeah, yeah. Uh, and, and just from a practical point, just from, from myself, um, one of the places that I, I was at, and, and I ended up having to take stomach pills and sleeping pills, and oh, it was just, it was just crazy. Oh. Um, yeah, and, and, and but it was me. It was on me because I didn't give them the limits. So I always say, hey, don't bug me now after hours unless it's important. If it's important, then go ahead and phone me. But if it's not, don't phone me. I mean, yeah. don't give me impossible tasks without with limited resources. So what I do is I go back to councils and I say, okay, this is the new task you want me to do. I don't have the resources. Which ones do you want me to take off now? So I will do it. If you think this is important, but we now have to say, we're not going to do this one in this next year. We might do it year after. And then as a CAO, take vacations, take your vacations and leave the phone at home. Now, that doesn't mean they cannot get a hold of you. We have email. If it's an emergency, send off an email, but leave that phone at home. I'm a type A personality. I just kind of always are constantly on it. Um, I never gave my council's boundaries. I would have a mayor who would work and he was a really, he was a phenomenal mayor. Loved him. Absolutely was phenomenal. But he worked a late hour. And he would always send me emails at 2 and sometimes text at 2 in the morning. And I'm stupid enough to actually respond. Um, I had another counselor two to three nights a week. He would phone me 
just a phone and say, oh, yeah, no, uh, uh, this is happening. You should be aware of it. It was nothing. And and really, he was drunk. <laughs> and that was, oh. the, the, that was the worst part. He just wanted to talk to someone. That same counselor every Saturday morning phoned me. And it became a joke in the house. It was like they'd all say, oh, is it counselor? Because the phone would ring at 8 o'clock every Saturday morning. I was stupid enough to answer it. <laughs> you know, so... The CAOs have to take some responsibility of this burnout aspect of it, you know? Okay. Um, you, we've just opened up a line of question that is near and dear to my heart because in municipal governance, municipalities don't end at 4.30 at night. I don't care who you are. And there are people in the in the municipal world, administration, foremans, city workers, the people out on the roads fixing the pipes that are broken or burst. That's great that you don't want to be called. You set those limits. But the reality of the job is you are a 24-hour a day, seven-day-a-week CAO. You are in the community. People know who you are. You uh, go to home and someone calls you at Saturday at four o'clock in the morning saying, hey, the pipeline, the water main on Main and 4th just bursted. We need someone here. As the communications person. I don't have a problem I, with that. But, but, I don't but have a problem with that. it sounds like I, you do, though. And I'm, I'm going to kind of I have a problem. Of... I have a problem if a counselor will phone you just because they want to chat. Oh, okay. On your personal time. That's well, the, com the, the complaints I get from from people. What you know, they're they're asking, what kind of counsel is this? Do they text? Do they feel it's okay to text me about every pothole that they find or every complaint about weeds on the garden they find at the moment and and feel it addressed? Um, no, you know that that's what you know candidates want to know before they apply that nobody is uh, or at least the candidates i've met uh, nobody is afraid of work nobody everyone signs up to take that responsibility and accountability uh, that's not the issue it, it, it's it's more about i guess degree um significance what i recommend going into any cao role is and, and and I talk to councils, just, you know, make sure the systems, the processes, the the the, under, the, the policies are in place, a delegation of authority um, to Christopher's point, some sort of communication protocol, um, you know, make sure those are in place. And if they're not, have a mutual understanding that they're going to be established. And, and it's important. Otherwise, A, you produce burnout, B, you produce a, a revolving door of CAOs. Um, it's it, it can be tumultuous for a community. Do you find prospective candidates, or even as of the role of CAO, telling councils or even telling councillors and mayors to stop talking to administration and deal with you directly? Because the role of the MGA states that any direction has to be given to the CAO. And a prospective candidate has to understand that very quickly. How important is it for that prospective candidate, that prospective CAO, that CAO to protect administration so they know what's going on, the CAO, and you don't have a counselor doing a walkabout and just directing administration to do the will of that one counselor's needs and wants. I'm going to start with Christopher on this. and I'm going to end with Ken because I have a follow-up about the council part. Okay, so a lot of people misinterpret the Municipal Government Act, especially in this area right here. So a counselor has no right, period, to give any direction whatsoever. They need counsel in the form of whatever it is. But what they can do is they can give them information and they can request information. Mm -hmm. So, for example, let's, let, let's do this. They could pick up the phone and they could say, hey, uh, Mr. Um, one of my directors, and I've always allowed them to talk to the directors. They need to CC me later, though, and let me know what's happening. We have a pothole, and the pothole's on this street, 97 and whatever. Okay, no big deal. We now have that information. Now we have a time frame, according to our policy, when that pothole has to get filled. 72 hours. It will be filled. Second thing is they could request this information. When will the pothole be filled on 77th, on 77th Avenue? Okay, we can give them that. What they can't do is they can't say, I want that pothole filled by tomorrow morning. So that's where people get a little excited. And they say, oh, you can't talk to staff. Darn right, you can talk to my senior staff. You, th 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 
I don't need to know about every little thing and, and deal with it. I just need to know it's being done after the fact, right? So talk to them directly, let them have that information, request information. We will deal with the issue. For counsel, for you, Ken, are you hearing from councils who want a CAO who will allow them to direct administration or get into the weeds as we talked about earlier on? Or are you, are, are councils kind of sure, like aware that their role is to only direct the CAO to do their, to, to do something? So I'm, I'm, I'm going to hearken a little bit about what Christopher said too. It varies and, and, there's a lot of gray area. We make sure in our search process and in the interview process, this particular question is addressed. The uh, engagement of counsel with staff and uh, uh, what level of staff. Honestly, there have been um, individuals, uh, candidate CAOs that are staunch, dead against any interaction with staff and they don't make it through <laughs> to become hired um there needs to be some flexibility and all honestly um there can't be abuse of that uh, where we've seen it and i've seen uh, ceos apply for jobs because they're leaving that scenario they just won't stop harking my greater operators and telling them where to do next and pro honest to god that 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 is a specific one so i think that's one of those discussions you have to have in the process of hiring a cao and and for both parties but to christopher's point there there needs to be some established protocols some policies perhaps uh what i really love and i've learned and seen in in many communities if established is that ticket system so an individual resident or a counselor on behalf of residents or themselves can register a ticket, whether that's a complaint or a request for action. And it's it's monitored both by the CAO and the, and the acting director of whatever department. Uh, that system seems to work very well and addresses that issue of being able to represent their constituents. Because I, I understand that it gets involved in, in the discussions in the interview. Well, I want to be able to talk to your director of public works because this always happens in my jurisdiction. Well, let's establish a system and a protocol to do that. But I'm telling you, that issue is a very big one at the point of interviews and, and uh, recruitment for CAOs. And, and, and let's just add uh, that the ticket system is, is phenomenal. It's, it's, we, I use it all the time. It also protects you. Because when someone says, hey, so if I had a counselor who, who phones me or my directors, they actually fill out the jippets and they would fill out the tickets themselves and then they can track it. Because if you have policies that say you're going to do certain acts at certain periods of time, you got to know when it starts and when it ends. And one of the where a lot of times the uh, the tickets fail is there's no follow up with the person who made the original concern. And I've always stressed that. Once you close it, you go back to the original person. We have completed this file. And, and, and it closes that circle. So communication, remember when we talk of Ray at the very beginning, communication. You need communication with council, staff, and also your rate payers. Um, but it's not direction. It's 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 communication. You know, it's right. like that's what it is. And it's there's nothing stopping anyone from getting uh, that information across. So I have two questions left and I hope you guys have an extra 10 minutes for me because I know I said 40 minutes and we're at the hour mark because this is how time flies when you're talking about municipalities on this show. It seems like it's yeah. 10 minutes, but it's actually an hour. I, we have talked about a lot of things over the last hour and we have talked yeah. about the good, the bad, and sometimes the ugly that comes with being the CAO and what a prospective candidate wants. I'm going to ask a very poignant question to both of you and it's both the same question. Is being a CAO desirable in 2024 as it was five years ago? All right, I'll, I'll, I can speak to that based on practical experience in undertaking searches most recently for CAOs. And I believe given the amount and volume of interest, uh, you know, some are... Uh, 
some are, are, are frivolous, but most of the quality applicants that come forward and the volume associated with that are indicating to me there's an interest, there's still an, an appetite and an interest. Now, there's a lot of what ifs and questions that go on with that. And I think the questions and list of questions to be answered has increased both on the council side. Can you and give me a few? The candidate side. What are some of those well, questions? Many of them are, are just what we've asked about compensation. Um, uh, because of the precariousness of the position of a CAO, most candidates now are asking for a severance clauses of, of significance compared to years back or not long ago, there weren't any. So, you know, things have changed, uh, but I do believe the passion and the interest for this career path still exists. Um, I think there's a, a, a definite um, intent to move in this direction. I, I think it's become a little more um, uh, uh, an option for many people in the municipal space and non-municipal space who can trajectory into that sector. But um, definitely, I, I, I don't think we're, we're at a loss. We are going to find challenges right now for the rural and um the, the northern and that is a known and experience right now and that's partly workforce availability and talent availability but also just family and work-life balance um it is becoming a difficult fill i have a follow-up question to that and i know i said i was going to ask one last question but i have a follow-up to that are you seeing more men as caos in 2024 or are you seeing more women get involved into becoming CEOs? You talk about Flagstaff County, 38 years, great CEO. But are you seeing more women being interested in becoming CEOs than you were, say, 10 years ago? Yes. Yeah, I definitely. Uh, the number of individuals who are aspiring, going through, many of your listeners are familiar with the NACLA or CLGM process, there's equivalent, you know, public administration um, certificates and diplomas, um, New Brunswick University, Regina. We're seeing more and more of those candidates emerging. Uh, individuals that perhaps were functioning as an assistant uh, CAO or were director of finance, and they're wanting that next, and they're capable of it. Um, I would say where we used to be 100%, 99% male, um, we're probably 70-30 now in, in CAO searches. That's awesome. Christopher, for you, is being a CAO desirable in 2024 compared to four years ago, 10 years ago? I'd, I'd say in a heartbeat. In a heartbeat. I, 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 look, um, you, you you do when you look at this role, you do understand you serve at the pleasure council. Once you get over that point and you develop a good contract to protect yourself, and that's something we haven't even touched on really that much. But really, if you have those two things hand in hand, then basically, yeah, it's 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 a great, 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 great job. I I I encourage anyone to to get into this field. Um, I've had more satisfaction doing that. Now, what your listeners probably don't understand, I have a varied background. I was in the military. I was a teacher. I was a, a chef. I was a, a business entrepreneur, um, a jack of all trades, master of none, and I became a CAO. And I love it. And it is a phenomenal field. And every day I wake up, um, are there pitfalls? Yeah, there's always pitfalls. And I'll tell you the pitfall I had when I was in the military. I was served with the UN peacekeeping forces and I had a guy jump over a fence, a Syrian soldier, put a submachine gun up to my head. I was 19 years old, cocked it, was about to shoot me. And I'm like, oh God, this is not good. You you have enjoyed your time in the, the world of CAO municipal governance, I'm assuming. And if I'm looking at your LinkedIn profile before, prior to this, it seems like you still have more to give. What do you look for in a prospective council in 2024 that you weren't looking for in 5, 10, 15 years ago? You know what? Honestly, I look for councils that can actually work together. I find the hardest thing is not the administration, not the, it's the councils themselves internally. Um, 
I had one one position where the counselors hated each other. They just absolutely hated each other. Um, and and, and they, they, they were fractured into groups. And one group disliked this other group. And they tried to get, you know, the CAO and staff to side with one group or the other. That's difficult. That's something that, um, you know, to, that's a difficult it, uh, situation going. Um, you can always build up your resources. You can always build up your reserves. You can always uh, uh, find creative ways to get things done. But you can't make people work together if they don't want to work together. I appreciate that. I have one last question for both of you, and it's two different questions. And I want to, they're basically the same, but they're two different. For prospective CAOs out there, Christopher, what advice would you give prospective councils who are going through the CAO hiring practice to look for in a future CAO? Oh, yeah. So, oh, that's a tough one. Uh, how about this? Let's let's switch this around and say, what should a prospective CAO look for in a council? I think I was going to ask Chris home. that. I was going to oh, ask okay. Chris and that. Okay. I was yeah, going to yeah. because he's the one who deals with council. You're the one who's dealing with the CAO role. So, what should a council look for in a prospective CAO? And then for Ken, I was going to ask, what should a CAO look for in a prospective council? Because oh, okay, I think right. it's two different unique. Uh, different visions that both of them are looking for. But at the end of the day, you have to give and take a little bit. You can't, you're not going to win hundred percent and you're not going to find the perfect job, no matter where you are. There's always going to be pitfalls, especially yeah. in municipal governments. So what should a council look for in a prospective council or prospective CAO that you would give them advice on? You know what, get someone uh, basically, um, who's a good communicator. I think, I think you need all the skills you can learn. If you, you if you have basic management skills, you, you could get through almost anything, but you need someone who's a great communicator and, and an educator, because what's going to happen here, it doesn't matter what happens in an organization. If you don't have a good communicator and in, in this day and age, especially because things are happening so fast, um, and, and, and councils need to know what is actually happening. They don't need to do anything about it. They just need to know about it because they're going to get hit. And if you want them to defend you or if you want to defend your actions and stuff like that, you need a person who's going to communicate with council um, and, and, and educate them. Why are we doing certain things? Um, you, you asked the question a little bit earlier. What's the difference? Well, the, uh, uh, 10, 20 years ago, the big difference is, 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 is all the legislation that you really have to be aware of that we are not, a lot of people were not following before, like occupational health and safety, uh, mental health, yeah, um, uh, trade agreements, uh, because you, you can't just give contracts to your friends anymore. It has, you know, you can get in serious trouble. So um, a good communicator can help an, a council basically get through almost anything. And of course, they have all the other soft skills too, right? Or hard skills, you know, get the education and that. But the key is a good communicator, I believe. And Ken, do you want to follow up on that, or can I? Ask I, I will you? just to just to add that I I I think I think there look you need to look as a council moving forward. You you, you need to look at you for somebody who's skilled in change management. Yeah. Um, you know, I don't know if your listeners yourself have heard of the designation proceed designation fear. Change management is essential now in any municipal scenario and and that change is either by a new individual coming in new processes new software uh, we all know asset management is becoming incredibly um, pushed on municipalities for for good reason and and maintenance schedules a CAO has to be imperative uh, understanding that change that implementation maybe not the software but what is it going to do and how should it be utilized so that's one example but also, to Chris's point, uh, Christopher's point, the, the soft skills important, but also there needs to be a line drawn. There needs to be a decision maker. Um, empathy is is fine, but there also has to be some emphasis on performance and productivity. Um, that has maybe slided in some areas because people are overly cautious about damaging relationships. But I, I think councils are looking for that doer. Uh, someone who will get things done within the parameters and, and obviously ethically. 
from a CEO's perspective. Uh, and pursuing... I was going to flip. I was going to flip the yep. question, but uh, I... from a CEO's perspective, what should counsel be looking for? What advice would you give counsel to make sure that the person they are going to get is going to be a good fit? Because I say good fit, not perfect fit, because there's no perfect fit for anyone. I don't. Well, care and that and that's it. <laughs> it every community. Uh, every municipality requires perhaps something a little different. And I would ask and encourage counsel to be honest with themselves. You're wanting a change agent? Ken, Ken, we need a change agent. Can you please find us that? I bring you three finalists through my process and they come to the table and they're being interviewed and, and counsel's worried. Well, I'm not sure if, 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 you know, the staff are going to accept this. I, uh, you know, this could cause problems with some of our neighbors and, and our, well, hang on here. You were, I, will, I needed you to be honest with me on what you feel your community, your municipality needs. Here are three very skilled, accomplished, but focused on change management and change agents. This is what you asked for. So, you know, hopefully you, you get to that stage and adjust before you hire the person. But sometimes I want, uh, they, they are not honest with themselves and what they ask for and then what they hire. And, and I just think I, I, I really encourage councils to really reflect. And, and we take them through processes for assessment and, and discussing that and exploring that. But, you know, you, you really have to be honest with yourselves on what you really need for the organization and be prepared for some of the fallout, even though it's the right direction to take, there will be fallout in, in any type of new person. Chris, do you have to follow up on that? Because I can imagine there is advice for to a prospective CAO that you would love to give them because you want to, you mentor, you call people up, as you've said during this interview. What advice would you give someone entering into the role of the CAO for the very first time that you wish you would have known? Uh, it, it, do your homework. Do your homework on the municipality. Um, if you have the opportunity to read the minutes, read those minutes. If you have the opportunity to watch the videos, watch the video. You can learn a lot from that. Um, what will happen here is there's always little changes you can make. And people accept the little changes. But if there's some big, major, major changes, then you have to have a long-term plan to try and implement them. But do your homework on the municipality. What are their strengths and what are their weaknesses? Um most of the municipalities I've gone into, their big weaknesses is financial, you know, so I've had to come on in and, 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 and when they're talking about asset management, one community, they hadn't done any replacements of anything basically for 25 years because they were trying to keep the tax rate low. And uh, so that was a big challenge to it go in there. It up to you, that's for sure. Yeah, it catches right up to you. And, and all of a sudden, like taxes are really shooting up. Um, but we actually had a... Pro our asset management plan would still be replaced everything in a hundred years. I mean, but it was something now, at least. I mean, um, we had clay pipes, clay pipes. I, when your listeners hear that, that's right. Clay pipes. We had uh, this uh, cast iron pipes. We had the, you know, the, the plastic pipes. We had, it was a, just a hodgepodge. Um, our, the community that I went into, what they would do is they would never replace anything. They would repair it. And in one year, the very first year I was at this location, we had three water main breaks, same street, just 200 feet down, another 50 feet down. I mean, that's really frustrating for the, the community itself. And But your taxes are low. <laughs> so Then you get into home. a situation where you're in a Soyuz, British Columbia, where your taxes are going to potentially go up 39%. That's mm -hmm. what we do. Um, yeah. Ken, Christopher... Um, I feel like we have just scratched the surface on the role of the CAO and what the CAO has. We may bring you back for part three of this to talk about what the prospective CAO can do afterwards or when it, when you know to throw in the towel and move on to your next community. Um, but I want to thank you both. I want to thank you from the bottom of my heart for taking time out of your busy day to do this. This has been awesome. For anyone wanting to learn more about Human Edge, the link's in the show notes. So please scroll down if you're watching 
watching this on YouTube, scroll down, you can click and you can learn more about Ken's organization. You can also reach out because I'll have the social media links. If you want, or if you are a prospective CAO, if you want to talk a little bit more, I'm assuming Christopher would be willing to have a phone call with you. His link to his LinkedIn page will be in the show notes as well. I highly recommend you reach out to these two gentlemen because it seems like they are a wealth of knowledge on the role of the CAO and what council is potentially looking for. And hey, maybe you might find a job along the way talking to Ken. Uh, Ken, Christopher, thank you so much for doing this. Greatly appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. And keep up the great work. This is fabulous. Yeah. And, 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 and again, this is a great field and I'm glad someone's talking about it. So wonderful. Thank you, Ken and Christopher, for joining us on Municipal Affairs today. Now, if you've enjoyed this episode and it has sparked your interest, hit that subscribe button now. Stay in the loop with all our diverse content covering everything from municipal affairs to the in-depth conversations we have on the cross-border interviews and even our eye-opening exploration of local governance in the political trenches, local government at work. Now, we are your go-to platform for comprehensive municipal coverage, committed to keeping you well-informed as well as engaged. Your support is the backbone of our growth and maintenance of the top-notch content you have come to love. Now, if you can, consider backing the show. Every contribution, big or small, amplifies the depth and breadth of our programming. Find the support page link on the Cross Border Interviews website today. Until next time, stay informed, stay engaged, and most importantly, just keep talking.